gosh, James' uh, talk was so funny. It's like following up Adele in a karaoke bar or something. All right, um, so thanks for your interest. Um, I'll be talking about neural networks today, um, how they work, how you can implement a neural network yourself, and hopefully also um, how you can improve your algorithm. Um, so this is me. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter, on GitHub, on Google+, although I'm like rarely on there, but it's always nice if someone's still on Google+. Um, so, yeah, I'm a web developer by day, and I basically turned a machine learning enthusiast after I attended the AI course by Andrew Ng. Um, that was the one that actually started Coursera. And afterwards, I wanted to like, use my new skills for a hands-on project. And at this time, I was in a betting pool in the office um, for the football um, league in Germany. And like every week, we have to come up with new predictions. And uh, usually, if you're interested in football, you don't, you're not very objective about like teams. Um, so it's, you're not using the scientific method, basically. So what I was thinking was um, that would be a perfect use case um, to implement something like a soccer match tendency predictor. Um, I'll show you what I was um, thinking and what I meant by that. So um, let's start with a funny quote. Um, this one's by Paul Gascoigne, and he's also known as Gaza. He's a famous English um, football player. And uh, he famously said that, uh, I never predict anything, and I never will. So uh, following his um, lead, I will also predict something. I will predict the tendencies of the matches for the Premier League um, this weekend. I think they will start at like 9 p.m. And um, then you can just check for yourself how well the algorithm actually performs and uh, whether you want to bet money on it. <clears throat> so, um, first of all, we have to ask yourself, like, what is machine learning? Like, why would we use machine learning? Um, so, like, consider we were, like, the programmers of um, an AI in, like, an RPG game, and this blue sword would represent a player's action, so the player would attack us, and then we will maybe react with a defense action, with a blocking action. So um, you could have some kind of behavior tree where based on your like, remaining health points, um, you would also have the option to launch a counterattack, or maybe you want to drink a potion. So the problem is, um, when you have to decide the appropriate actions, um, this, you will decide it when you program this tree. So the, the inputs and the weights, um, so how important is the health in proportion to the player action, for example, it's um, deterministic because you decide on it beforehand. Um, this also means that the decision-making process is um, very subjective because it's implemented by a programmer or a game designer, and the machine cannot adapt to individual player styles. It doesn't, it doesn't learn. Um, let's say if we wanted to implement this in a deterministic way, it might look something like this. So uh, if the player attacks, um, we look at our health bar, and then we say if the health bar is like above 75%, then we do a counterattack. If it's between 25 and 75%, we do a defense action. And if we have less than 25% of our health left, then we will drink our health potion. Um, so these uh, thresholds, um, they have to be cho chosen beforehand, and they might seem arbitrary, um, or like it's just like a personal feeling that what makes sense. But in complex games, um, it might not be possible to manually implement all the possibilities and all the things you want to look at. So um, we would not want to have this like um, this deterministic logic. Instead, we want to have something that will change our logic depending on something else, maybe. So this entire thing should be very dynamic. So um, the way that you can do this is with calculus. And I'm trying to not go too deep into math because I like, don't have the time for it. But let's just take the scenario that we have the what the user did input. And then we add the how healthy we are input. And then we will get something that uh, pertains to the three possible outputs. Um, of course, like the two inputs are not equally important for decision making. So what we need here is some weights. Um, in this case, I just called them A and B. And basically, those weights determine how important those inputs are in relation to each other. And then in the end, we don't want to directly have like the action that we want to take. Instead, we want to have like a probability distribution. 
Um, this could, for example, just be like, how, what's the most probable action that a human player would take, for example? And um, this way, it's, it's called classification because we try to classify um, the, the, the correct output for the given inputs. And uh, once we have the correct weights, like if we, if we can calculate the best A and the best B, then we have a model that represents the logic or the pattern that we want to make predictions on. Um, and the thing about models is, like George E.P. Box said, that all models are wrong, but some are useful. And what he means by that is basically um, that our model will not give us the perfect or the correct result, but it will give us one that is the best approximation to, um, to reality, basically, or to the data that we already collected. Um, so this is basically the magic inside a node, but it's not called neural node, it's called neural networks. So we have to like, understand what neural networks are. Um, so the important question to answer is, how does anything learn? And uh, some clever people um, took a look at it, like how learning is done in nature, and as you already know, probably, um, it's done by neurons, and this would be one neuron. A neuron receives input through its dendrites, that's the fuzzy purple tentacly stuff, and then there it has the soma, which is the middle part with the green core in it. And inside the soma, there's magic happening. Um, the input gets changed in a deterministic way inside the soma, and then um, the result of it is um, sent through the axon terminals. And um, in nature, of course, a decision in your brain is not made by one single neuron, but by a vast network of neurons. So we can have multiple layers of neurons. In this case, for example, we have two layers with two and three neurons. So in all outputs from the previous layer will be sent to all nodes in the next layer. So in the end, every node um, will output a value pertaining to one single, um, like one single possibility that you can take. And um, the thing to take away from the slide basically is that instead of one neuron doing the magic once, um, you have multiple neurons that do it in parallel and also sequentially. So um, even though each neuron changes values deterministically, the whole thing is not deterministic. Um, okay, so this is basically the same representation that we saw before, except now um, I just changed the, um, the natural neurons with artificial neurons. And um, so for the, for, for the math to work its magic, we need numerical representations of our inputs and outputs. So for example, we can represent our health bar in a percentage, which would be 95% in this case. But um, so I personally think it's better to have like, the most information possible. So instead of saying um, that we have 95% of our health left, we could say that our maximum health, or that our current health is 114, and the maximum health is 120. And by that, our um, algorithm can um, deduce that it's 95% um, health left. And then um, we have the attack. So the attack is something, it, it could be a string or a label, but um, in this case, our neural network needs, needs a numerical value so it can calculate on it. Um, we could just give it like an ID and then just map it somewhere. Um, but I didn't really like that idea because I was afraid um, that I would introduce some numerical implications that I don't want to. For example, if attack is one and defense is two, then somehow my neural network could think that the, the blocking action is like twice the attack action. So this doesn't sound very smart. Um, one way to counter that is to instead use a vector or an array in the JavaScript context. So. Um, by using this um, array, I basically say that there are three possible actions that the user could take, and he took the first one. So basically, that's like a, like a bool array. Um, so in this case, the first value would be attack, and the second would be defense, and the third would be potion. <coughs> so um, how do we get our predictions? Um, the, the first thing is, um, that I'm talking about is going to call um, is, is called forward propagation, and um, it's called that because we propagate data forward from our input nodes to the output nodes. So um, we start with our inputs. That's the one you've seen before, and then we send each input to each node in the first layer. So let's focus on the upper node, so it's not too complicated. 
And in this node, we do our math magic. So we have our weights, and we multiply it with our inputs, and then we get an, um, a new value, which is x11, because it's the value we get from the first node of the first layer. And then we send that new value to the next nodes, and then um, the, the lower node does the same thing, and in the next layer, all the nodes do exactly the same thing again. Of course, the weights are different here. Um, I just called them D and E. And then we get a value in the end. So I just, I just said that it's uh, 0 0.67, um, because this would be like the probability of the um, action that is like directly linked to this node, because like each output node is um, referring to one possible output. Um, OK, so um, now we have basically made predictions from our training data, but the prediction is not that good, because in the first iteration, we choose our weights randomly. And um, now we have to, like, the machine learns by trying to get better at predicting st stuff. And um, so my first instinct would be you could just reverse engineer, right? Because you have the, the data, and you know what's supposed to be the output, and then you can just, like, reverse engineer. And this is more or less basically what the machine also does. Um, this is called backpropagation. And you might have guessed already, it's because we propagate data back from the output nodes to the input nodes. And let's say like these are our predictions. This is the probability that, like, for example, a human player would take this action with the given inputs. And then this is the actual result. This is like the truth that we know from our data set. And then we need to figure out what the costs are. And the costs are basically just the difference between the actual result and what we predicted. So in this case, it would be 0 0.33, 0 0.14, and 0 0.19, um, respectively. And now, inside the nodes, we do not try to get the right inputs. Instead, we try to calculate how we would have to change the weight so the cost is lower next time, like in the next iteration. And I'm not going to go too deeply into that right now, because it's like, it's very mathematical. Um, but after we've done that, we will backpropagate the values to the first layer, and we will do the same thing there. OK, um, so one way that uh, we calculate how to change the weights is called like, gradient descent. There are other algorithms that you can use, but in this case, I want to show you um, the gradient descent, because it's, it's easy to explain in a graphical representation. So. Um, Let's say our data um, is, will be represented in this 3D um, representation. And we'll take a very simple example with like, only two numerical features, like only the max health and the current health. And then um, we have our um, weights. So we do not plot the actual input data. We plot the weights. So um, that's A and B. And then on the z-axis, we plot the cost. Um, so the idea is that in the front, you have high cost. So um, the, the predictions that you make are very far from the actual reality. And in the back, you have low cost. And the way we plot data in this three-dimensional representation is we have those circles. And the circle means that all the data points that are on the circle, so all the combinations of A and B that are on the circle, have the same cost. And then you have different circles, like this one. And it's the same here. Like All the different um, data points on this circle have the same cost, although this circle is a little bit darker. And I made it darker because I wanted to represent that the cost is lower. Um, so they all have the same cost on the circle, but of course, it differs um, um, from, the, from the previous circle. And then we you know, like further plot the data, and then we get like this kind of funnel where you can just ba basically you look inside the funnel, and in the middle, that's our global minimum. That's the, the point where the cost is the lowest that we can ever get with our, um, with our algorithm. So um, the way that gradient descent now tries to get there mathematically to the red dot is that we start somewhere randomly. Like I said before, we choose A and B randomly. And then basically gradient descent just like walks steps towards the global minimum, and it just like wanders around a little bit and just tries to, tries to approximate the global minimum. And at some point, hopefully, it will get there. It doesn't really happen that often in real life, because we don't actually know what the global minimum is. We can see it here because it's graphical, but um, if you have a mathematical representation, you, you don't actually know. Um, <clears throat> 
So the idea of this whole thing is like we iteratively approximate our model to the truth. Okay, so I hope you're still with me because this is going to be, um, I'm not going to go further into it because um, it's interesting to know how neural networks work, but when you implement something, you want to use a framework and not be bothered by all the mathematical stuff. Um, so I'm going to like um, introduce you to another um, smart guy who said this longer quote thing. Um, he says, an approximate answer to the right problem is worth a good deal more than an exact answer to an approximate problem. So basically, the better you describe your problem, the better your approximated answer will fit it, even though it's not perfect. So, okay, um, let's implement something. Um, I will not do a live demo because I'm really scared that I'm, that's, that's not going to work. Um, I have used a Node.js library, which is called Synaptic, and like I said, it implements all the fun math stuff already, and we just have to like build the application. So these are 22 lines of code, and it's basically all you need um, to predict a tendency with the artificial network. So we're not doing like AI anymore for RPGs, now we're doing um, the prediction of um, uh, soccer matches. So first we have this historic data, we have inputs, in this case it's the market value of the two teams, home team and away team, and then the output represents the result. So in this case the first element would be that the home team won, the second element would be um, representing a draw, and the third element would be uh, representing um, that the away team won. And then we have like matches that, are, that haven't happened yet, they have, of course, also inputs, but they don't have an output because, we, of course, we don't have a result yet. So that makes two um, data sets, basically. Um, and then we have to build our network. Um, we use the number of input nodes that um, is the same number of inputs we have. And then in the, um, we have three output nodes because we have three different classes that are possible. And inside we have hidden layers and I just like I just chose two layers with six nodes. Um, it's not that this is the law or something. And then we have to get a trainer for a network and then we train on it. We tell him what the learning rate is. The learning rate is basically the size of the steps that gradient descent takes. And this is also I just chose that value um, because it just felt like it. And also, I, I have to define the number of iterations, which is how often you go through the entire training set to train your network. And then, um, when we're done with training, we actually make predictions. And uh, if I would run the script, it would look, look something like this. So, um, what we can see, like if we look at the first prediction, um, the the home team is worth less than half the, uh, of the away team. And the probability of it winning the match is also about half of the probability to lose the match. Um, this seems pretty straightforward and probably would have what I would have predicted too if I just only had those given data. But when we look at like, the third prediction, um, although the home team is also worth about half compared to the away team, our machine predicts that it's slightly more likely to, for the home team to win the game. And this could have a lot of like this could have a lot of meanings. It could mean that there's something like a home team advantage, or um, there's like a different like implication that we don't know about. And the problem with machine learning um, prediction is that we don't really know how a machine gets there because it's non-deterministic. Um, this model is purely mathematical, and the weights don't translate into something that you can understand intuitively. So we can't reverse engineer something like home team advantage unless we actually implemented it. <clears throat> OK, so I hope you're still with me. Um, this is how we implemented it. Now we have got like our predictions. And then now how do we know how well we're actually doing with our algorithm? And if we know how, we're, how well we're doing, how can we implement uh, How can we improve it? So um, when we want to fig uh, figure out how our algorithm performs, there's something called the error. Like the error is, like I said, the difference between the actual real result and what we predicted. And um, so Synaptic already gives something, uh, has something like that. It's called the data.error. And all we have to do is add a schedule to our trainer. And we say basically that every 10,000th iteration, do the stuff that um, I give you in the function. And basically, we just log the data error rate. And if I run this, it will look like this. So um, we can see that there's an error rate of 0 0.19. This does not mean that like 
19% of our predictions are false. This is a mathematical error rate. It's the mean squared error, and it's basically just the distance, the error is just the distance between our predictions and the um, truth. So this doesn't really translate into anything. Like, if people ask me how well does our algorithm perform, if I say my mean squared error is like 19 or 0.19, no, nobody knows what I'm talking about, right? So I wanted to like, try to come up with a, a metric that is more straightforward and that would tell me an error rate that I can actually understand. So um, I was uh, coming up with something that's called the classification error. It's basically the same thing um, where we, uh, in this case, we have an error counter and then we do a, a classification, actually. Because now, before you saw that we have a probability distribution, and um, now we want to make an actual prediction from the distribution. So basically, we say, this is the most likely, so I'm going to predict this. And then we just count the numbers, uh, the, the times that we are wrong, and then by, um, I'm sorry, from that we want to um, calculate our error rate. And um, in this case, if I run my algorithm, it would look like something like that. You can see that the um, error went up compared to the mean squared error, which is logical because we actually make predictions and we can either be wrong or right. Um, we don't have like a distance anymore. So we have this data, but it's, we use the classification data, um, we use the same data that we trained our network on, which is um, not very smart because our algorithm should um, actually predict something that it doesn't know about yet. So to figure out how well our algorithm performs um, with data that it doesn't know about, we basically take our data sets and then split it in two-thirds. Um, basically, we take two-thirds of the trainings, uh, of the data set to train, and then the last third we use to classify or to, to validate our, um, and measure our performance. So I have to speed up a little bit. Um, basically, we do the same thing that we did before, but um, in this case, we just use the cross-validation set to make our predictions instead of the training set. And if we run the uh, script, it looks something like this. Again, um, our error rate jumped up a little bit, and also it's just like all over the place, it's, like super weird, because it doesn't seem to like go down steadily, but it just like jumps around. Um, so, okay, we know those error rates, and I'm gonna skip this slide real quick because it's just like a summary. Um, and the next question would be how do we interpret this and how can we actually improve on it? I'm gonna have to skip this slide too, I'm sorry. Um, okay, so there are like a few things that I wanted to try to improve the, um, improve the algorithm. First thing is adjusting the learning rate. So we saw that the error rate was jumping like up and down and up and down, and this could mean that we already like reached the global minimum and are just like wandering around it. Um, and I just wanted to like try uh, what would happen if I just um, changed the learning rate. So this is the um, error rate that we had before with the um, learning rate of 0 0.003, and then I just changed it to 0001. And this is what happened. What you can see is that the error rate is a little bit higher, but now it like slowly goes down. It doesn't like walk around anymore. And this could mean that if I do more iterations, I will get a better like error rate. I will be closer to the global minimum, even though my steps are smaller. Um, in this case, I just decided to leave it at that to just show you what, um, what can happen when you change the um, learning rate. And I wanted to try some other stuff too. So the next thing I wanted to try was to just simply get more data. And I, get, I just um, added two new seasons, which was 100% more data. And again, this is the learning rate from before, uh, the error rates from before. And these are the error rates after I added more data. And what you can see is that between the um, 10,000th iteration and the 100,000th iteration, there is like a bigger difference with more data than with less data, which means like if you train your algorithm like 100, 000, for 100,000 iterations, but the error rate doesn't change that much, you, you don't really have to, right? So um, this could mean that it actually it were, would be worth your time to get more data. Um, then the last thing that I tried was to simply add more features, to give the um, algorithm more inputs, which would also just mean that I'm describing the problem better or more detailed. So um, before I had two features, those were the market values of the two teams. 
And now I just added like three more features, um, the positions of the teams in the table before the match starts and also the uh, match day. So I'm saying probably it does have an influence how far into the season we are and how well they are um, compared to other teams. And now if we look at the error rate right now, it looks pretty good, except that the cross-validation error seems to go up at some point. But it's still, it's performing better than having only two features, so we could say from that that it might make sense to put more effort into um, getting more features. So, um, yeah, those are the things that I actually um, tried. And um, this is basically just prototyping stuff, just trying stuff out and then decide what would be like, worth my time the most. And there's also this thing called regularization that like, real data scientists use, but I unfortunately don't have the time to really go that deep into it, but we can talk about it later after the talk. Um, okay, so I'm gonna um, pull up another quote, so you're still with me. Um, so this quote is most famously attributed to Niels Bohr, but I'm not quite sure if he actually said that. Um, but the quote is, a prediction is very difficult, especially about the future. And now, as you have seen, it's not even that easy about like, predicting stuff in the past or the present. Um, so what I want to like, talk about now that I'm coming to the end um, is how do you actually work with um, machines, like how do you actually work when you're doing machine learning? And um, what I've learned is that you have to work incrementally. You will, you will get there eventually, but neural networks are just basically like your brain, and practice is what makes perfect, so you can't expect to have the perfect solution like right out of the, out of the box. You have to slowly get there. Um, you have to think about the problem, not the solution. Uh, the reason to work with neural networks is precisely so you don't have to come up with a solution yourself. You're giving, giving this to your machine, and you can put your time and effort into thinking about how to best describe your problem. Um, you should try out different configuration parameters. Uh, if you start with a new uh, problem or a new thing, then no one can tell you what your perfect learning rate will should be, or how many layers you will need, or how to choose like what, what, what kind of configuration param parameters you should use. You should just come up with a metric that is important to you that you can understand, and just like change stuff and try it out, and then basically see what it does to your metric, and then decide which way you want to go. And the most important thing about machine learning is it's about the data. Um, if you have data that is biased, you will get biased results. I don't know if you remember this one incident where like, this face recognition software would flag like, African Americans as like, apes. And that's not because the machine is like, evil or something, or racist, it's because the data was biased. Um, and so you have to be really careful what you give your machine because it's going to learn from this data and not anything else. Okay. Um, so I have this recommended reading section in case you want to read up more on machine learning and just um, dive into it. I hope I've like, made it clear that it's not really that complicated to actually build something with it, even though you're not like, totally into the math part. Um, the first link is a link to my repository, and you can find the whole thing there, like I, the whole data retrieval included and how I implemented um, the whole like, um, error, error recognition, blah, blah, blah. error rate, um, perf er perf I'm sorry. So you can just check it out there. <laughs> um, then this is the little link to the library I use, Synaptic. Um, I have the I have also linked to the course. I'm, I'm, I'm think it's not that interesting now that I'm gonna like tell you about like each and every single link. I'm gonna um, put up the slides later. I'm gonna um, add it to Gitter, I think. Yeah, Gitter and Twitter. Um, so you can check it out there. But also, there's this amazing page called Coding Games. It's basically just coding for fun and coding with your friends and everything. And they have an awesome new machine learning section that uses TensorFlow. Um, TensorFlow is a machine learning library for Python by Google, if you don't know that. And it's like really easy to use. Um, and you should totally check it out. OK, so like I said before, I've done some predictions for the Premier League. Those are the predictions. You can like, take a picture right now and then check, and then you just bet money on it, and then we can just see who made the most money tomorrow, by the end of the day, or like tomorrow. And then who made the most money should just buy us all drinks, I guess. All right, um, so that was it, thank you.